Um, welcome to the first lecture for class on uh, um, Monday, and I think it's going to be May by then, almost. Um, and we're talking in this class about uh, the Odyssey and grief ministerial self-care. So um, the first, uh, so some of the questions that that we want to address are: uh, What are some ways in which uh, grief impacts uh, the ministry, the entire ministry of a pastor, uh, regardless of what their context is, whether that's um, and whatever religious tradition. Um, in what ways is kind of ministry an ongoing exposure to grief, and how uh, might you continue to care for the questions that are raised by the grief work of your ministry um, in ways that keep you grounded and whole and uh, keep you well. So um, I have kind of two different articles on this, and uh, I think we'll start with the liminality and grief care article. Um, this article was uh, written as I was doing hospice chaplaincy, actually just as I was going into my PhD program uh, after doing hospice chaplaincy, and I was influenced by reading a book by Thomas Lynch, uh, late 90s book called Undertaking, Life Studies in a Dismal Trade, and um, I had a, a chance to, uh... so um, Thomas Lynch's work was an influence on me, and uh, I was reflecting on some of my chaplaincy uh, work in this article, and then um, I was also thinking about kind of sy symptoms of burnout that happened to ministers and how... Uh, they might play out in the whole um, process of grief care. And so in that in the article, I, I talk a little bit about some of the different steps in caring for grief um, in ministry. So, um, and at the same time, make some connections between what uh, funeral, what undertakers do and what ministers do. So Lynch says that um, ministers are kind of in between life and death. And that's a, there's something kind of funny about that. A minister shows up in the hospital room and someone immediately asks, is some, some, something I'm not being told here. And so there's a sense in which uh, ministers um, are ritually um, impure. Uh, the jokes stop when ministers come around typically. And so there's kind of a sense of uh, being a liminal figure, uh, an outside, a bit of an outsider figure uh, for, for ministers in general. But there's also a sense in which, which ministers uh, are drawn to that or benefit from that. Um, maybe a slightly more serious type than your average person, but someone who's kind of willing to go there with people. And, uh, and so being in ministry and being associated with the, being more and more comfortable with the vocational identity of minister means over time um, kind of like appreciating how quickly you can get to the heart of the matter. And uh, I found that to be the case, especially especially in hospice ministry. Um, so that kind of bringing what really matters uh, was valuable in that I tended to have conversations that I found were deeper than I, I would have um, with kind of small talk with friends and neighbors um, when I was doing my ministry. But over time, I think people who do grief work, and my, uh, you might be feeling called to that as a result of this class, kind of tend to experience um, kind of the grief overtaking their place in a sense. So um, I was a hospice chaplain in San Antonio, and I still kind of, when I drive around San Antonio, I still remember certain places or experiences in certain neighborhoods. So uh, Lynch says that as an undertaker especially, he noticed he was frequently reminded of loss in his day-to-day -day life. Um, and so ordinary ministry kind of becomes overlaid with loss. So the question, um, and in that process, uh, the question is kind of how do you continue to minister and take care of yourself when you're frequently exposed to things which are beyond your control? Um, and maybe that's all of us right now in this COVID-19 era, but I, when I wrote it, I kind of had the sense that there was this group of people who had kind of normal life, and then there were ministers who were more routinely exposed to things they had no control over. 
Um, Lynch says what we do in response to those things is we try to hold on to the grief and also meet it with activities that he calls undertaking. Um, the things we do to vest the lives we lead against the cold, the meaningless, the void, the noisy blather, and the blinding dark. Uh, the voice of outrage, song, and prayer. So um, Lynch, in that double entendre of undertaking, thinks of what he's doing, not just picking out of coffins, but um, really attending to the practicality of what it means at the end of life to be caring for the richness and depth of what life was, caring for the bodies of the dead, providing hospitality. You might think, what are some ways in which ministry is kind of like that art of undertaking? In what ways is it different? In what ways uh, do ministers create a space for loss in the midst of life in ways that uh, many other figures don't? Uh, So what's that distinctive role? What's that activity of ministry? And how is it kind of making space? So um, I understand that Tom Lynch and Tom Long went on to do uh, uh, a whole book on funerals that you might want to take a look at, accompany them with singing. But uh, I was building on Lynch's ideas when I wrote this article before their next book came out. Um, and I said that the minister performs liturgy, crafts, and preaches what I call an elog elogiac or elegiac, I'm never sure how to say that, funeral sermon. Um, and uh, the minister also gathers the family and hears some of those difficult stories and uh, weaves them in, to a, in relationship to the, the text of the tradition. So, um, and I almost think that ministers who have a pretty well-established uh, liturgical sense have a benefit over those who are kind of uh, making it up uh, along the way, but I myself have a little bit of both. And uh, the big idea, I think, in this in this article, in this part of the article, is really to kind of preach and show up in ministry in a way that allows, in which you allow yourself to be touched by the loss that you're experiencing. Um, so there's a, this is the tricky balance. Uh, there's a sense in which you could just go on with your um, activities and not really allow yourself to be touched by what you're seeing. Um, but the most, I think the most meaningful, uh, well, Lynch says it so well, you know, you allow people to grieve uh, as Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, Christians, and uh, while still proclaiming the, the faith. So he has tremendous respect for ministers who get up and take their best shot, he says. Um, but the really important thing is to allow people to experience their grief, to allow people to experience their death anxiety. Um, and also, I think, for you to experience something of it as well. So the idea behind the elegiac sermon is that you use some elements of the person's story, and you can get family together uh, beforehand to hear some of the stories and themes that want to be addressed, they want to want to have addressed. Um, so it's not a sermon out of a box on a particular passage like the resurrection uh, uh the discussion between Martha and Jesus after Lazarus's death or something like that. Um, but there's really a kind of, you dwell with the stories of the family and you dwell with the text of the tradition and try to discern um, kind of what the sermon is as you discern what the, what the particular uh, proclamation of the good news is in this season. So it is a proclamation of the resurrection. It's a Christian service. Um, but I also think you need to find ways to kind of allow uh, space for the theodicy to emerge. So what what's the particular grief in this situation? What is the question towards God? Um, and find ways to address that question in your funeral sermon um, as clearly and directly as possible. And so in order to do that, I think it has to kind of touch you. And the best ministry I've experienced over the years has had that quality of uh, embodied engagement. Uh, not afraid of the minister, not being afraid of their own grief, but kind of allowing it to impact and speak into what they're doing. So the big idea here is that the practical activities, those undertakings in the midst of grief and loss, um, Dorothy Zoll, and by the way, in her book, uh, The Mystery of Faith, uh, The Mystery of Death, talks about how 
uh, women are frequently responsible for those end of life uh, death care uh, ritual bathing uh, body care th things um, and so th those activities that happen and not incidentally it's it's the people undertaking uh, those grief care activities uh, t tending to Jesus's body uh, after his death that become the first witnesses to the resurrection and so there's a sense in which Christian evangelism is born out of this caring for the dead. And uh, one of the dis distinctive aspects of Christian faith is showing up for funerals, I think. Uh, all of this makes this time of COVID uh, especially difficult, I think, for grievers. Um, so all through this, there's a respect for where people are in their own grieving process, a right to they have the right to declare the dead dead. Uh, so there's that story about the Episcopal deacon who calls the body just a shell and uh, gets slapped by the person who they're care they're uh, caring for. Be a, there's a sense in which uh, the, the grief belongs to the family and we become witnesses to it. Um, and the, I talk about the pastor kind of remaining in a contemplative position. Um, so as they... Uh, listen to the stories of loss um, as they proclaim their faith, uh, that faith also kind of needs to remain a mystery um, to allow flocks to grieve like humans. I'll just say briefly, the minister also doesn't need to forecast or proclaim their own doubts as kind of the content of the proclamation. I've seen that done before as well. Um, where a pastor has gotten up and said in front of a whole co grieving congregation that the pastor doesn't believe in the resurrection resurrection any longer. Um, and that was kind of, I noticed, uh, kind of pas uh, pastorally ineffective in a sense. Um, the minister's own doubts or questions became the text, primary text, rather than those who were grieving in that, in that space. So um, kind of discovering what matters to people in their faith, what are the central themes that are guiding their grief process, then becomes a big part of the preparing for that, um, for those rituals that ministers do so well and are frequently called uh, called to do. Um, so the main idea is allow your flocks to grieve like humans, um, which I know, because I know you all, I know you do so well already. Um, and the big one of the big ideas is that triumphal funeral sermons, if they're disconnected from the experience of grief, can kind of uh, seem inauthentic. Uh, and the funeral act itself is always embedded in a, lar a larger network of pastoral care where you're doing the undertaking activities. And these undertaking activities, what, uh, you know, Lynch isn't calling it just undertaking, but kind of more generally undertaking is that which um, we, we do in community in order to invest life with meaning in the face of death. Those undertaking activities lead us more deeply into community. Um, and so as we consider the historical roots of those activities, we, uh, we become more connected to place. We become more connected to our historical roots. Um, so there's a kind of set of losses involved in such, um, such ministry. And uh, there's also a lot of need for self-care as a minister goes through these kinds of uh, griefs. I think that many people I know who are doing ministry from week to week have weeks where they maybe have more than one loss um, in their congregations. And as congregations are aging, it's really important to consider how ministers are going to be impacted by uh, the losses in their church and, and not to neglect the loss of ministers themselves and the theodicy questions that they might ask. Um, so when you lose, I know you're not supposed to have special friends in your church, but when you lose those people who are kind of core to the identity of your church and your community, and who've supported you in ministry, um, it really can enter, usher in a new a new era in your ministry and can mean uh, a new moment of transformation. So I might, be, I might be just wondering and asking as we're thinking about this particular topic for today, um, what kinds of grief work are the most difficult for ministers um, and what might re require the most uh, care for the pastor? Um, and... Does being responsible for the church's grieving or the grieving of a community allow a minister enough opportunity to grieve? Um, so let me try to answer those briefly, and we can discuss them in class when we get together, too. 
I think the griefs that are going to be the, the most difficult are the ones that are going to be, um, for some reason, you're going to have some strong positive feelings towards this person, or you're going to have connected quickly and there's going to be a kind of attachment. Um, and Or it's kind of related to your life cycle and theirs. So the loss that you're experience, experiencing with them reminds you of a loss that's maybe been ungrieved in your past. Or it just is a surprise. Uh, it's not, wasn't even on your radar, something that was significant. And then that happens, you can kind of feel like an overlap between your grief and that person's, which can make it hard then to provide, uh, provide the care that you want to in that moment. Um, I also think there may be some things that ministers can do um, to create spaces for their own grief and to acknowledge uh, with with their peers, their own work. And one, I think, is just remembering um, that that ministers are people as well and that they grieve just like others in their care. And remembering that um, and learn, since we've learned so much about what grief needs look like, applying some of the lessons from this class and allowing yourself to mourn in your ministry, I think can be a crucial but un, maybe unacknowledged part of the pastoral work. Um, and especially the pastoral work of self-care. So as you're thinking about uh, liminality and grief work and Lynch's chapter, do be on the lookout for signs of your own burnout. Um, Lynch calls it the kicking the dog stuff. When you kind of bring home the grief and anger that uh, that comes from your unanswered theodicy questions. So do do be noticing if you're experiencing that uh, overload and fatigue from your, from your ministry. Um, and uh, try to find some ways of being supported in that, uh, because I think we know uh, that ministry is uh, constantly exposing us to those things which challenge uh, meaningful existence or the notion of a just world, and then we are, then have to do a, a journey of loss and a journey of meaning-making in order to stay engaged in that ministry. Um, but it's also where the gifts of that ministry lie. So um, thank you for listening to this. Uh, the, uh, this article means a lot to me, and I'm grateful that, to be able to share it with you. And uh, I hope it also provides a model for you if you are interested in developing some of your work uh, in community into, into an academic article in pastoral care. I encourage that as well. Okay, thank you so much, and God bless.